No? Okay, so let me let me check. Okay, so I need to I need to do something, stop sharing. So I go to share one second, share content. Uh, probably that should work now. Can you Illegal. can you uh, hear now? Rivers of Cambridge. Namaskar, everyone. Uh, yes, yes, yes. We can hear. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, hi everybody. Welcome to PER Physics Education Research uh, Session. So the first speaker I have. Uh, by the way, I am Rudra Kafle. A faculty member in Uster Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. Welcome to this session. So our first speaker is Mr. Rizendra Thapa. Uh, Mr. Rizendra Thapa is an MSc graduate from in British University, Bareilly, India. Currently, he is a physics teacher at Kathmandu World School in uh, Nabi. He is uh, incorporating technology in physics teaching in Nepal. So. I am uh, now presenting him, and his presentation is on uh, assessment of effectiveness of virtual simulation for tutoring introductory level physics based on the syllabus uh, syllabus of Nepal Education Board. So let's listen to him. Seeing us to at Kathmandu World School and A level at Nami. Today I am going to present on uh, the preliminary report entitled. Assistant for tutoring intro level physics based on the syllabus of Nepal Education Board. I would like to overview my talk with the abstract. For the past two years, I have incorporated fit simulation in guiding high school students both first to uh, syllabus based on MEB and A level uh, based on the syllabus of Cambridge International Examination. Today, in this talk, I will discuss uh, the discrepancy in the effectiveness of faith on these two syllabus uh, with some supporting evidences. In addition to it, I'll uh, try to cover how teachers in Nepal can use virtual simulations in guiding students learn introductory level physics effectively. So as a methodology, I developed a questionnaire which consists of 10 questions. And all these 10 questions were uh, uh, categorized in three categorization. The first categorization was uh, to find out how effective is faith simulation for high school students in learning physics uh, in session guided by tutor, uh, just like classroom settings. Uh, the second categorization was how often uh, high school students yeah, prefer physics uh, and uh, the third category was oh, sorry. preparing for the physics exam. And in the context where only uh, few uh, high school students and teachers know about faith simulations. Uh, I just posted uh, a question so that I, I can find out how likely do these students recommend faith simulations to be well known for uh, the high school students studying, uh, studying physics in Nepal. So as a summary of all these responses, uh, we, uh, we come onto this chart. Uh, as we can see on this chart, uh, the responses of strongly agree and agree uh, was higher in comparison to strongly disagree and disagree uh, for plus two students. And the same was uh, seen here for A-level students as well. In, in addition to that, uh, what we find is uh, uh, the strongly agree response uh, for question number 10 and question number one uh, contribute highly uh, and then uh, 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 for for the response agree, uh, uh, the the response of agree from uh, question number nine and question number two uh, play, a, uh, play a high role here, as you can see from the start. Similarly, uh, in a level, uh, uh, for for uh, the response of strongly agree, uh, the response for question number ten and question number two uh, uh, had a uh, had a uh, high high role. Uh, uh, similarly, if you have to pick uh, two uh, responses that play a, a high role in this agree category, we, we find the responses from question number nine and the response from question number one. So uh, in both plus two and A level, if we find uh, the responses uh, 
two question number 10, question number nine, uh, and then question number two and question number one uh, was higher. Now, what are uh, these questions uh, one, two, nine, and 10? So uh, by seeing at this data, what you find is that both uh, A-level and post students uh, agree or strongly agree that they enjoy the physics classroom uh, incorporated with FET simulations. Uh, they strongly agree or agree uh, that FET simulations help them clarify the basic concept in physics. Uh, they agree or strongly agree that FET simulations have increased their confidence in explaining difficult concepts related to physics to their friends. And then they strongly agree uh, that they wish every high school students who are studying physics should know about phase simulations. So from this data, what you can conclude is uh, the phase simulation is highly effective in tutoring plus two as well as A-level students. But while uh, we come on to that conclusion, we have completely uh, neglected uh, the responses related to neutral. And then if we uh, see both in plus two and A level, the, the response related to, uh, or the neutral response uh, uh, is coming from all the questions. Uh, so from, from, from all the 10 questions, we find uh, the response neutral is contributing to this neutral category. Uh, so in this context, uh, we don't think that uh, we can uh, ignore this category. So if you don't ignore this category and and if somehow uh, the responses that were neutral uh, is converted into disagree and strongly disagree, then that's a real problem. Uh, uh, so what you find here is uh, if this neutral uh, somehow tends to disagree and strongly disagree, then about one third of positive students do not find faith simulation effective. Similarly, uh, if this neutral uh, category comes on to disagree and strongly disagree, about one fourth of A-level students do not find the fifth simulation effective. Uh, in other words, in a, in a group of uh, 37 students, around 12 students uh, studying plus two and around nine students uh, studying A-level find fifth simulation ineffective. Uh, and, uh, and, and here, if you see here, uh, there is the higher chances of uh, the responses neutral uh, to become disagree and strongly disagree in plus two com compared to A level. Why? Because if, if you see the column here, uh, the chart here, we see only uh, uh, there is the response of disagree regarding to question number six. And the question number six is, I would like to use phase simulation for doing physics assignment. And, and uh, it's not a, a concern. The concern is really here. Here in this disagree category, if you see uh, the response to question number seven and question number eight has played a vital role, or we can see the peak uh, in this disagree column is because of the response of question number seven and question number eight. And if you see here, question number seven says that phase simulations help me in making exam preparatory notes for physics. And uh, question number eight suggests that I recommend phase simulations my friends for exam preparation in physics. So seeing this chart, what you can say is that uh, majority of the students who dis disagree uh, disagree on the fact that the fifth simulations are not effective for their exam preparation. And with the fact that uh, uh, high school students, majority of the high school students uh, are motivated to study physics in order to score good marks in their exam. And if fifth simulation, uh, are not, uh, if fit simulation is not helping them uh, to prepare for the exam, then uh, there is a question of the effectiveness of fit simulation. Uh, so, uh, and then as you, as you can see here, uh, there is no any uh, disagreement in the exam preparation. So what you can conclude is that the effectiveness of fit simulations in tutoring plus two students is much more questionable uh, compared to A-level students Unless, unless we can convince the students or unless we can uh, show students that faith simulation is equally effective in exam preparation. So this comes on to my final slide. The final slide is how can a teacher use faith simulations in guiding students non-introductory high school physics effectively? Or uh, to phrase it, how can we show that faith simulation is 
highly effective for exam preparation. For that one, uh, I would like to uh, 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 so uh, one of the uh, simulation, uh, and this simulation is related to uh, photoelectric effect. Uh, now I would like to show how we can uh, explain to student that fit simulation is highly essential or is highly effective for the exam preparation. Uh, in uh, in grade 12, if you happen to see the exam format, uh, there are three types of questions. One is numerical problem, uh, then another is uh, short answer question, and another is long answer question. Now, how can fit simulation help them in solving numerical problems? Uh, so, one of the numerical problem is uh, uh, the, uh, the electromagnetic radiation of wavelength 149 uh, nanometer falls on the sodium metal of work function 2.2 2 electron volt. Now we are asked to find out the maximum uh, kinetic energy and the speed of the electron. So in order to solve the numerical problem, uh, we can uh, show students that this phase simulation will help them to visualize the problem. So if students can visualize the numerical problems, it will be very much easier to solve the numerical problems. So this is how we can show that uh, the phase simulation help them in uh, uh, solving numerical sort of problems. Second is uh, sort Short, short, short questions, short type of questions. It's like, uh, what happens if we double the intensity? Uh, uh, if we double the intensity of this radiation, what happens to the kinetic energy? So we can uh, uh, tell them, or we can uh, inform them how we can solve these questions. It's like by doubling it was 36, uh, 33 percent. Now, if I uh, made it as 66 percent, uh, then what? What variation do they see uh, in the uh, uh, kinetic energy of this electron. So, so we, we can show how this can help them to solve uh, short questions. Uh, similarly, in order to solve uh, a long question, the long question deals with the uh, de uh, defined photoelectric effect and derive an expression for it. So, if if we give uh, the students uh, uh, assignment uh, or if we ask them to uh, present uh, the presentation on the photoelectric effect uh, dealt with this uh, or um, looking at this fit simulation. Uh, then they can uh, find the importance of solving long answer questions also. So, uh, so if we can, uh, if we can help students explore the benefit of fit simulations in exam preparation, then it will be highly effective uh, for uh, learning high school uh, physics uh, based on uh, Nepal Education Board. Or else, uh, it is uh, questionable. The effectiveness of uh, uh, the fit simulation is questionable. And it is much more strongly questionable compared to a level. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, uh, that was outstanding presentation. Uh, 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 thank you so much, uh, uh, Rizendra Ji. Uh, do any of you have any question to Rizendra? At least one, uh, maybe one question. One question. Hello. Uh, is the system working well? Uh, can you hear? Can you hear me? By the way, just quick. Check. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, do any of you have any question to Rizendra Ji? Okay. So, if Ruth, not, uh, okay. Yeah, Rudasa, thank you. Rudasa, thank you so much. So, if they have any question, then they can email me, or we can have chat in other okay. platforms as well. Thank you so much, okay. sir. Okay. Thank you. A very nice presentation. Thank you so much. So. Let me go to now next uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I uh, now the next presentation in this list uh, is uh, Dr. Uh, Ramesh Dungana. So I would like to request uh, Dr. Uh, Ramesh Dungana to share his uh, file. Okay, great. Okay, uh, uh, a brief uh, one thing I would like to request to my uh, sessions presenter is. Uh, please, uh, if there are some slides which are uh, we, we can give a small amount of time, please do that. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Ramesh Dongana is a physics faculty member at University of Colorado at both at Denver. Quantitative critical thinking with interactive labs. So, with that, I would like to request. To share, Dr. Dungana, uh, to share his screen and start presentation. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Rudraji, and thank you, Ampa, for providing uh, this opportunity for me. So I'll be sharing my experience on developing some of these labs that we are developing right now. And uh, uh, we use some of those labs for the summer, and that going to go in full place uh, during the fall. Although this lab, these labs are developed for the in-class <laughs> uh, use, uh, but uh, we are somehow optimizing this for the online as well. So if uh, some of you are wondering like uh, what this guy is uh, writing here, uh, besides this PhD degree, uh, these are basically in-service training. Uh, I received uh, one from uh, the Central Department of Education, Trivon University around, it was around 1998 that is PGDE, Postgraduate Diploma in Education. And basically, it helped me to actually understand or actually understand that teaching is not just a presenting content, but it is also art of presenting the content. Uh, so, so that interest developed, and then I got another opportunity uh, while uh, teaching here in uh, University of Colorado, Denver, and I jumped into another one year long uh, training. So these are my degrees. And uh, those uh, degrees uh, plus right now I'm uh, serving as a, you know, serving in a curriculum committee in our department. So uh, that capacity in that capacity, I'm developing these lab. I got opportunity to develop these labs. So uh, some of the material I have developed for these labs, you can find them in this YouTube channel, Raw Physics. You still go there and watch those videos before they come to the lab, okay? And I'm not active on social media, but sometimes I share uh, some of my, uh, let's say, photos and uh, some, uh, let's say, teaching materials. So if you are interested, you can visit those sites as well. So, Basically, I'll first start with the survey of the goals uh, different universities uses uh, to teach introductory physics labs. And then I'll uh, talk why I am focusing on developing a skill-focused lab rather than the content-enforced labs. And then I will talk about how am I developing these skill-focused labs. And then finally, I'll present uh, two examples of these labs that I have developed. And these labs are uh, developed from the inspiration uh, from the Cornell University. They are also actively uh, developing these kinds of labs, and uh, I am kind of uh, studying what they are doing, and I am modifying them as uh, our need in our department. So I usually like to interact with the audiences. So that's why I have brought this question. So what should be the goals of intro lab courses? What do you think? Okay, so if you like, you can indicate those by, let's say, showing your finger don't show the middle finger, but uh, other fingers fine. One for the <laughs> number one, two for the number two, and so on. Okay. Uh, so, or you can also uh, type that on the chat if you like. Okay. I'm going to give around 15 seconds for that. Let's see how many of you are interested, uh, you know, getting involved in this one so let let's see so somehow i don't see the videos but uh, and of course all these videos are turned off so any so if you can please try to type those okay and so far based on the chat what i see is there are these varieties of options not just one, there is no agreement in single goal, okay? So that's what I've got out, that's what I got out from here. So let's look at another survey. 
And this survey was done by the Center of Science Education, uh, Tata Institute of uh, Fundamental Research in India. So I'm bringing this because we fellow Nepali physicists <laughs> participating here. Maybe that could be of interest as well. So they ask about what kind of goal physics lab should be, uh, should have. So they ask that kind of a question and uh, uh, there are some responses. Just like we saw in our uh, session, like uh, we had these different views. Similarly, we see these wide varieties of views and these are only 10 out of 50. All those, if you're interested, you can find in this reference, reference uh, you, you see here. Uh, so, so what does it mean is that uh, there is no single uh, agreement on what should be the goal. And of course, we are not just focusing on a single goal. And there are some goals from the uh, American Association of Physics Teachers. In short, it's called AAPT. So I like to skim through these and uh, uh, what we see is, uh, first of all, we see there is this uh, emphasis on modeling, designing the investigations. And then after that, it moves to the uh, data analysis and then goes to the physics concept. So help is then to master the basic physics concept. So what does it mean is we are seeing this mixture of different types of goals and the lab we've been uh, using to teach our students in different universities it basically lines up with these kind of goals uh, that are the mixture of let's say learning the concept versus learning the skill data collection data analysis and so on so there is no surprise okay and then later in 2014 what happened is uh, the same organization came up with this different recommendation. And this committee consisted of like three, three fellow members from the different universities of, of Colorado. And uh, one, Randy Tag, you can see in the bottom, he is my colleague in my department. And currently he is developing labs for the seniors and the juniors undergraduates. And I am focusing on uh, the lower division uh, in, uh, intro uh, physics labs. So here we see now there is there is no content enforce, enforcement uh, kind of goal here. Okay, so if we look at the uh, details, uh, that's what what we find is uh, there is a collection analysis and then developing worldview or model uh, something like that. But we don't see the enforcement of the uh, content. So that's what we see here. So now, uh, it also emphasizes on the uncertainties uh, that was missing on the uh, previous part. Of course, that could be the you know part of the uh, data analysis, but now it emphasizes and specifically that uses that word don't forget about the uncertainties to uh, let's say uh, tell the validity of these uh, data so here is a survey and in this survey uh, what they do is uh, let's say they look at the final exam performance of the performance in the final exam of the students who took the lab class versus lab versus who did not take the lab but to take the same physics course and uh, they chose the question uh, that was you know like related to the concept covered in the lab as well and then uh, they did the study and they presented the finding so now the question is what do you think what they may have found okay so here is a question for everybody here for the to the participants okay so what do you think was the concept was the major impact using concept in the lab was the major impact on the performance in the physics lab okay so that's the question here major or some or no impact so i am seeing mostly one and there is two as well one again two and so on 
So mostly one and two. So now here is the result. Surprise, surprise. There is no impact at all. Okay. So those is then who took lab. For example, in the lab, we focus, let's say, principle of conservation of uh, momentum. And if the same question was asked to the student who took that lab versus who did not take the lab, the performance was similar. There was no difference statistically. Okay, there is no difference. And so that's the surprising result. So all these things motivated me and our colleague in the department that let's not focus on enforcing the concept of physics in the labs, rather focus on developing the skills of analyzing data and then uh, analyze data and then uh, get the, uh, let's say, result uh, as if a scientist does in any discipline, does not have to be a physicist, okay? Uh, so here is another study. Uh, we see the same result. There is not major impact, okay? And so uh, these, are, these are our goals. So our department has lab development committee and committee decided with these goals. With these goals in mind, I have started developing labs, okay? And since we are just focusing on the skills, what happens is we don't have to use fancy equipments. We can just use simple equipments like pendulum. For example, the lab I am developing right now, I use a pendulum and use that for uh, three different sessions, three labs, okay? So let's look at how does the example look, lab look like. So now if you look at the heading of the lab, it simply says compare two measured values using the uncertainty. So it's a skill focus right there. So traditionally we may say, okay, find the period of the pendulum or something like that, or compare with the um, value, something like that but we don't do that. So right now, what I'm doing is I'm writing the learning goals there, and I'm also telling them why you are doing this experiment. So right there, okay? And then after that, what is it? So now uh, the question, another question for the audience is, okay? So now I showed you these two things. First, there is title with the goals, and then, there is motivational, uh, let's say, sentences that, uh, let's say, hopefully motivates them uh, why, you know, to do that lab. So now there is question, what other elements do you expect in this lab manual I'm writing? So, so please go ahead and you can start typing the numbers. Uh, And you can put multiple, if you like, multiple numbers separated by comma, if you like, okay? So I'm getting five, four, one, and four, and four again, and four again, and number two, and one to five, everything, oops, they kind of contradict, but anyway, and number four and so on. And now, the, what I'm doing is none of the above. There is no procedure in my lab manual. There is no data table to fill. There is no formula for the pendulum and so on. So there is none of those things that you usually expect from a traditional labs, okay? So they are none. So what do they do then? So for example, we give them a pendulum and then say, okay, go ahead, uh, time the period of the pendulum, starting from, let's say, at 10 degree amplitude and 20 degree amplitude and see if you get the same result. And these are not actual results, by the way. Uh, the time, these are for the, let's say, I, I made those uh, for pre-labs. Okay, uh, so here is another question. So looking at this A and B, and of course the second term here is the uncertainty in the measurements, okay? So let's suppose a group A came up with that value and group B came up with the another value. 
So now, based on that, do A and B, are they same or they are different? So that means, uh, what does this observation telling us? Whether the period depends on angle or not, okay? What does this result telling us? So now, for you audiences, okay, participants, so if you think they are the same results, then type one. If you think they are not, then say two, uh, okay, and so on. So I see one, I see one, I see one, and I see all of them, I see one. So looks like we are all experts here. So yes, by looking at the uncertainties, for example, if I were to just visualize that, what we see is there is significant overlap in the result, okay? So that means although the value 1 and 1.6, they are very different uh, based on the uncertainty. When we take account of the uncertainty, those results are statistically same. They are not different, okay? So that's what uh, this is telling us. So what does it mean? So it's telling us it does not depend on the angle. So now what we tell them is, Go, try to find out uh, to, you know, reduce the value of, find a way to reduce the value of that uncertainty. Uncertainty looks too, too large. That's what we say, okay? So is then go, and then somehow they come up with a different result, okay? And uh, so what's that process in this case? So what we do is we say, let's say, make the comparison, and look at your result, what's the result means, and then go back and then redo the experiment. And then, uh, you know, come back and make the comparison again, go in this cycle. So that's what we say, okay? So what happens? Then let's say this is the critical thinking. If you are uh, thinking what is quantitative critical thinking, if you are, let's say, wondering what quantitative critical thinking means, this what quantitative critical thinking is, okay? It's the ability to make decisions based on data with its inherent uncertainty and variability. So they can judge the validity of data, okay? So uh, that's that. Now, let's say they went and then, let's say rather than just measuring, let's say just uh, one period, time for one period, or one oscillation, I should say, they measured the time for 10 oscillation and then uh, found the period from there and that reduces their uncertainty. And uh, when the uncertainty gets reduced, what we see is now these are two different values. Indeed, they are not overlapping as we saw. So now, and there is a mathematical formula they can use and these are actual data when we do that kind of measurement and increase uh, the, you know, like uh, number of periods and then reduce the uncertainty. What we find is indeed we see those values are totally different. So what does it mean? Then at that point we tell, okay, if you look at the book, most likely you'll see the book tells you there is, you know, the, uh, the period does not depend on angle. It's not amplitude dependent. You see, you don't see angle in the period usually in the books, okay? And at that time, they haven't gone through those, you know, like let's say a derivation of the period and so on. So what does this mean? So what's the message we are trying to give here? Twofold message. One, first, recheck your data, even if you think you got the valid results, just like for example, uh, in the previous result with large uncertainty, what we found was that, okay, uh, the uh, the values are same, they were not different. And that is, uh, you know, that is what exactly the usually the textbook says. So they may say, okay, yes, we found the result and we, the result agrees with the theory. Okay, we are done, they may think, okay. But what this is telling us that if we be careful, then we may get different result than what we expect. And then that may lead to a new discovery. So this is, of course, just an example, but that's how we are using this kind of lab. So lab doesn't end by just getting one result, okay? That's not where it ends. That's where the main phase of this lab begins. 
and of course we haven't drawn this lab you know fully so i don't have results from me but similar uh, you know uh, it was done similarly in cornell as well so for example this kind of uh, conclusion they get from the student so for example they they can construct knowledge by refining their result and then sometimes uh, they can you know like uh, uh, discover a new thing here even in this with this simple uh, result so we try to choose the labs uh, you know that from the surface they may look obvious but when you very careful in that case you may get some surprising result okay so now uh, in physics 2 we mostly focus on developing models and again uh, here we for example we are i'm using electromagnetic induction as an example but uh, uh, the main uh, title is creating a mathematical model so that's how we are focusing on the scale okay so again goals are there and their motivational exp you know statement is there and then traditionally yes we've been I i'm pretty sure you're you have done the electromagnetic induction lab you have taught the electromagnetic induction lab so what happens instance take some data uh, you know uh, the setup usually is provided and then the table is provided they fill that and then they calculate the percent difference and say okay based on that percent difference they may say okay i got good result or not so good result but so how am i doing differently here okay so in this case what we do is we show them a demonstration so we let's say uh, move a magnet uh, through the coil and then uh, show them, okay, there is deflection in the voltmeter. So that means voltage is being developed. So now, what do you think? What factors affects that? So you then have to think about that and come up with the list of the list of the elements that determines the uh, voltage, for example. And then what happens is uh, once all the lists are given, then we assign uh, those particular elements to the each group in the lab and then they do their own investigation okay so for example one student may have gotten yeah, let's say how does the number of turns uh, affects the uh, uh, voltage for example production of voltage everything else keeping constant so they get the data they make a plot and based on that they come up with the Uh, they come up with the model, for example. So they have data, and then what happens is they use this data to model it. Uh, three minutes. Okay. So they 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 model it. Okay. And then what happens? They come. They all come together, and then what they do is uh, uh, they combine that model and comes with the empirical relation. And once that is done, what they do is they retest their model see if that model works by doing uh, designing another experiment okay so how are we uh, making them uh, you know work interactively how are we making this lab interactive so we them we give them three lab question where they uh, go through them and interact with that question first so that means they interact with the, some of the main content main concept of the lab we are doing and then the main interaction happens inside the lab. So there is group discussion. They make the plan and they write the procedure here. Okay. So instructor and any learning assistants, uh, they basically act as a facilitator. Okay. And then uh, they document everything in the lab notebook. Okay. So that's uh, that's not a new thing. So anyway. So in a conclusion, uh, that's uh, that's my conclusion. Okay. So lab designed to uh, reinforce the content are not easy achieving this goal. So why bother doing that? Rather focus on the skills. And that's what we are doing, okay? So next step, we like to test the effectiveness, the way, uh, you know, effectiveness of our way of doing the lab. And there it is. Thank you, everybody. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dungana. That was outstanding presentation. Uh, very clear, very nice. So, audience, uh, if you have any question, I would like to 
uh, you un please unmute and ask uh, maybe one or two questions. Yes, uh, Professor Kafle, thank you. And uh, I have one, actually, my, myself, mother. Can you hear me? Kind of. Uh, yes, yes, uh, please. Dr. Givine, please go, go ahead and ask question, please. Thank you very much for the very nice talk, uh, Dr. Hunkana. So yes, I, I am here. I am listening. Yeah, please, please. But we need to... Yes, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are listening to you. Yeah, please, please go ahead and ask question. Uh, so, uh, probably you are muted. Okay, one second. Okay, let me, let me unmute. Okay, one second. Uh, Sometimes you have to disable the video so that the sound is clear. Uh, okay, I think uh, Sunita is there. Okay, oh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Dr. Gimire, please ask question. You are, you are unmuted. You are good. Uh, I think there is some kind of problem. Do any other, while we are waiting for him. Yeah, but is there any that lab is not very much essential in the context of research if that is the case i somehow disagree because basing on the lab we get some sort of idea and uh, basing on that idea we go further and try to understand what is the main rim of physics so that uh, uh, i felt a sort of when i go out also i mean uh, uh, if i don't do lab work and I go out and I don't have any sort of uh, concepts that what should we do. So in that sort, maybe I a uh, little bit disagree with what you are saying. Can you please clarify yeah. about that? <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. And I totally agree. Yes, lab is essential. Lab skill is essential. What I'm trying to say here is that lab that's designed to verify the physics law they are not helping to learn physics, okay? We need labs, of course. We need lab, we need those skills. I totally agree with you. And that's why we are focusing uh, on developing lab that focusing, focuses on developing skills rather than proving the, let's say, uh, conservation of momentum or period of the oscillation of pendulum or something like that, okay? So we pretty much agree. I think there is some misunderstanding, just that. You are muted. Ah, thank you, thank you. That's very much, uh, very nice. I agree now. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Rudra, sir, you are muted. So thank you very much, Dr. Dungana and everybody, all audience. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gimine. So Sunita, could you please kindly unmute uh, Dr. Vijay Arial and also please, uh, I, I think you can make him host. I mean, the presenter, sorry. Uh, Dr. Vijay Arial. Okay. So uh, thank you. So our next presenter in physics education research uh, is uh, Dr. Bizay Arial. Dr. Bizay Arial is a physics faculty member, associate professor of physics at University of Minnesota at Rochester. Uh, Dr. Arial did his PhD in physics, actually physics education research from Kansas State University. Uh, and today he's presenting on innovative physics instruction to provide a student learning of skills. So I would like to invite Dr. Vijay uh, Arial. So the floor is yours. Let's go ahead. Uh, uh, I, I thought I had unmuted. Yep, 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 you're good. Okay, uh, and sharing, share content, I wanted to, okay. Optimize that one. Thank you very much, Rudra sir. And I would like to thank Enpa 
for giving me this opportunity and i also would like to thank all the attendees for the session so uh as you can see my talk is related to skills learning of students uh so first of all i would like to describe why should we care about this because we would like to help students learn skills transferable skill they are useful not only in physics but beyond that in other disciplines as well as in their career so here i would like to distinguish skills into two categories discipline specific and interdisciplinary skills yes we know that in physics and math and so many different areas we have some discipline specific skills maybe they will overlap in other disciplines also but i would like to name some of them like quantitative skill experimental skill and these days people talk a lot about ICT uh, and there are some skills problem solving critical thinking flexibility and adaptability we must teach students those skills because in this 21st century people have access with internet they can learn the facts but skill should be taught in a more formal way so here is the p21's framework for 21st century learning yes they have listed so many important things that students need to learn so that they are useful in their life but here i'm listing some of the areas they have highlighted a lot that is learning and innovation skills in this area we have creativity and innovation critical thinking and problem solving communication and collaboration there are other things are also listed but many employers and many educators actually value those skills a lot that is why i'm highlighting them here now the question is how to achieve that how to achieve that goal how to teach skills in more formal way that is the question in order to achieve that we have undertaken some efforts here i am collaborating with some people so here i am providing a couple of examples of interdisciplinary uh, effort and then i will talk something more physics specific physics only so here one example is I have been collaborating with faculty from chemistry and math for uh, last few years. And the goal is to help a student definitely learn his skills. Besides that, we have seen that students need to identify integrated knowledge structure. Because if you look at physics, chemistry, and math, there are some uh, knowledge. Also, they are interdisciplinary or integrated and students don't acknowledge that we must foster their ability to acknowledge that likewise we definitely want to help them transfer their skill from one discipline to other discipline of course we want to help them transfer from their um, graduate school undergraduate school to their career also so in this effort we have done some study we designed a course and then we also uh, studied and from the study, we what I found is instructors some have they have some expectations, they have some perception about this kind of effort. They said that basically there are so many themes emerging from the study, but one of the main major themes was that they found the importance of homogeneous interdisciplinary integration. Yes, people do lots of integration, but one discipline at a time that doesn't help. It has to be homogeneous in nature. Uh, there should be no physics, chemistry, and math discrete. They should be homogeneous. So that is what many faculties are realized and reported. Likewise, students also appreciated this kind of effort. They say that mathematical knowledge or quantitative knowledge is relevant in other. By the way, this study was for introductory level physics, introductory level students. That is why undergraduate students who are taking physics, chemistry later, but they are taking math. Um, in that situation, we did this study. So uh, I just would like to give one more information from this study. I'm not going to spend a lot of time about this interdisciplinary because I have to spend lots of time doing some tool um, specific for physics later. Therefore, I would like to just wrap this up real quick. And what I found doing a survey, um, basic skill uh, diagnostic test is using that uh, tool. What I found is after doing this kind of innovation this kind of intervention we found that students were more confident after having this kind of courses but it's basically one course basically that's why one course uh, we found a gain uh, of 8.4 percent and that was significant uh, with um, p value that much 
So that is one example of innovation where we integrate different disciplines to help student learn skills and transfer those skills. And I'm going to provide another interdisciplinary example. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, uh, lots of time in this one. Uh, I'm going to uh, provide another example, even more exciting, uh, that this involves physics, math, but literature. So after collaborating with them, uh, we did inter um, qualitative study, and we looked at students' epistemological belief about discipline and disciplinary learning. What do they think about them? What is the, I mean, like, what do they think about physics? What do they think about math? What do they think about literature? Likewise, what do they feel about various disciplinary learnings? And from that study, what we found is, yes, they said that, yes, ambiguity, navigation of the ambiguity, that is uh, good, that is possible in literature, but not in math and physics. But eventually what we found is actually, they said authority is the main thing that has the greatest impact, their willingness to navigate ambiguity. So ambiguity, yes, everybody is uncomfortable navigating ambiguity, whether they are talking about physics, math, or even literature, any discipline, they are uncomfortable. And what we found is when we provide them real, uh, uh, so they want the, they are uncomfortable applying STEM concept to other areas. They are uncomfortable and they always need some authority, outside guarantee. So they are uncomfortable and they also want to apply more formulaic formula uh, problems because yes, contextual problems are interesting, but they are uncomfortable doing those, those kind of problems. From experts point of view, what we thought is actually context help them navigate the ambiguity, but we found the opposite. Actually, context doesn't help them navigate the ambiguity, but they, they confuse them even more. So, and we also found the importance of interaction of interdisciplinary service skills. Actually, they evolve over time and they change over context. And if students are trained more, they can transfer the learning. That is one of the things that we found from this qualitative study. We also found that we must teach students expert epistemology and metacognitive techniques. If you, if we really want to make those things happen, basically, if we want to help them um, support navigating ambiguity, and yes, we must teach them in a more formal way. So again, uh, I just provided a couple of examples. I don't want to spend too much time on this one, uh, but these are some of the efforts where interdisciplinary efforts are important. If we really want to teach interdisciplinary skills and transfer of learning in a more meaningful way. So that is the message I wanted to give to you. But now I would like to switch gear, gear to some physics stuff, problem solving in physics, because I have all highlighted this one of the most important skill um, in the current world. And in physics, fortunately, we teach problem solving. And here is the definition of problem solving. So if you already know, how to do a problem that is not a problem. Many students of ours complain that, oh, I don't know how to do this problem. My quote is, if you already know how to do the problem, that is not a problem. That is an exercise. So yes, physics course integrates lots of problem solving. That is very good. And yes, it is challenging a task. Just from the definition, it is challenging task. But why should we bother teaching this? That's the question. Here, I have provided a couple of examples, a couple of references, why we should care. Basically, when I was looking at those surveys, more than 85 to 90% of those people, those employers, those educators, those agencies, they said that problem solving is their number one by overwhelming majority, like about 80, 90% in those surveys. We have other surveys also, but I just wanted to share with you some of the uh, some of them so everybody emphasizes problem solving that is why we should care because we want to help students develop a skill that is relevant for their life so the question is how should we teach problem solving as i said before problem solving is not problems are not exercise they are problems so in order to help them learn in a meaningful way 
the way so that they can apply in other disciplines in their future. We must teach problem solving using some systematic way, some standard way. So I'm going to provide you the framework that has been used for a while, not only in physics, but in various disciplines. So that framework is called cognitive apprenticeship model. So in this model, it is starts with modeling, coaching, fading. Modeling means we provide an example and then comes coaching where students have to do on their own, but they will get some guidance. Just like when we're teaching people how to swim, we have to, yes, they have to go in the swimming pool and we can train them while they are swimming. And then comes fading where instructors doesn't provide any support. That time, maybe they can get some support from their peer. And during the coaching, maybe you can provide some Socratic dialogue type uh, scaffolding also. So this is the framework, um, cognitive apprenticeship framework that has been used not only in physics problem solving, but any decision making process, this framework is used. So <clears throat> now the question is for this talk, I am going to talk about a tool. Basically, I would like to mention something that, yes, I am talking about innovation. So I said one of the innovation is change your curriculum, integrate other disciplines. That is one way to teach skill so that people can transfer. Now, we can also change the way something is taught. That means we can change the tools. So here I'm talking about the tool. The tool is sometimes we may use computers in coaching. Yes, computers have some limitations. However, when there are no people helping students, the computer should be there to help them. That is why we should use computer coaching. And why should we care about this? Because it will provide systematic coaching. Yes, a student can follow uh, the framework that I just described, and students can mimic expert-like behavior. And it is convenient because when th there are not people around them, then they can get the feedback at their convenient time, whenever they want, and most importantly, non-intimidating environment. Because when there is a person, people, sometimes students are afraid, they are worried about asking questions, okay? And then for research and assessment, it has some value because students' areas of difficulty is not only in problem solving, even in physics can be identified if we look at how students interact with the computer in answering the questions. So we can improve our instruction, instruction. So here is the tool that I'm going to present to you. Um, it is the computer coaches. It is called the computer coaches C3PO. Uh, it is web-based. Uh, it is developed in University of Minnesota, a physics education research group. Uh, the, uh, the, it is written in Adobe Flash and it has two graphical user interface. And then, uh, obviously, uh, the computer coaches provide real-time guidance and feedback for decision-making when students interact and when they're trying to solve physics problems. So this, uh, we have two versions of this uh, tool. Uh, version one, version one is already done, and I have this picture for this version. And you can use, and there is the link uh, unfortunately, it is in Java Flash, and that is going to expire in December. So we have to think something else to use a different platform. As far as version two, this one is concerned, it has no issue. But the issue is it has not been done fully. We have been using um, a beta version, but not uh, fully functional. So um, this is the computer courses. Here, I would like to let's hope that uh, this will play. I'm going to do this one. Hopefully, does it play? Should I click or does it play by itself? So here is one example. Oh yes, now it is playing. So it is um, basically you can see uh, the question here, and it is a clip from a student interacting with the system. So basically, students have to go through several steps to complete a problem, sometimes even 100 steps. And they have to answer those questions, drag, drop, they have to do so many things, and you can see some of the actions they have 
tagging. And typically, in order to complete a problem like this, it takes somewhere between, in average, 40 minutes, not less than 30 minutes. So if a student is very competent and if you want to, if you want to use complete this one, they may finish in 30 minutes, but um, usually it takes more than that. But the good thing is if they are able to do one problem on their own, they can apply in 1,000 new problems on, on their own. This is how it trains them, because they have to think not one. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, I, yeah, it, it, uh, in order to compare, it took them several yeah. minutes. You can put in Okay. Okay. And okay. okay. so, then, in square, you have to click that and do that. And then I click yeah. it and put two. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So you can submit it now. Okay. So now you can do the calculation and put the number. Okay, so that is the tool. Um, basically, I just showed a clip of one minute. Actually, in order to complete this, the student took almost 40 minutes. So there are so many steps. Now, um, why many, yes, this is the tool. But many people will ask, maybe many of you will already have a question or two, maybe multiple questions. So here are some of the things. Do the computer coaches help improve students' problem solving? So that is the question many people definitely would ask. Do students like to use them? I mean, even if they are useful, maybe sometimes people don't like to use them. Do students use them effectively? That is another question. So I would like to mention some of the prior studies of ours that we found that female less prepared and less confident students use the coaches more frequently because they need coaching and it is normal that they tend to use this tool. And we also have evidence of positive impact of the coaches on students' problem solving, particularly, I mean, I said exam performance, but particularly while grading their problem solving. So we already have some evidence, but I would like to provide more evidence uh, about uh, positive impact. And before that, I would like to show you a survey result also, because I said that whether they like or not, that is also important thing. So uh, here is a survey in a small sample, 126 students. And in that survey, what we found, I mean, there are so many things we found, I cannot explain everything today, but the main highlights were, they said that step-by-step -step support was very, very useful. Problem solving, they learned problem solving from the tool. And they say particularly it was very useful when they were starting the problem because they did not know how to start and how to set up the problem, but this tool was very, very useful. And obviously they had some comments also about the system and they say it is time consuming. As I said before, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, people are, students are not so patient in terms of, they don't have patience in terms of time because I mean, they would not, they would like to finish something in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. But they don't, I mean, they later understand the value of spending 40 minutes because if they spend 40 minutes, they can do 10 problems on their own later. So that is why it is worth spending time, but they realize later. But when they start do this initially, they think that, yeah. And in adequate feedback, yes, there are so many feedbacks. There are hundreds, I mean, 70, 80 steps, up to 100 steps. But still, they feel that sometimes there are inadequate feedback because they may need some kind of feedback and it is just the computer, uh, I mean, steps that we write we cannot write unlimited amount of feedback. Technical complexity, sometimes they have to use the computer and sometimes some technical glitches, something happen. So that is another thing. As I said before, yes, in a uh, smaller sample size, like 126 students, we had another um, evidence about this. Um, basically, I mean, I wanted to highlight this one. Basically, there was some impact in exam problem solving um basically if they are heavy users versus non-users and there is a difference in terms of their problem solving performance uh in exams uh and oh never sorry uh okay so 
We compare those groups with other areas also, like class participation and assignments in class. There was no difference. Uh, class routine assessments before they use the coaches. When we looked at those students, and there was not much difference there also. The only difference was in the problem solving. That means the coaches had a positive impact. So that is what we can suggest from this one. In order to understand even in a deeper way, we conducted student interviews because and how they use for that. We interviewed students also, and we interviewed 19 students. And the, the interviews were, first of all, they interacted with the coaches that was videotaped, and we analyzed how they interacted with the system. And then they were interviewed. And uh, most of the student felt that it is alternate to the human coach. And as we wanted, they say it is non-intimidating because they could use at home, outside, um, without nobody watching them from behind. So it is non-intimidating. So that is great. So did they find it useful? Particularly here, I'm reporting one more time the interview result. Basically, many students found it is useful. Yes, 50% useful. Some say partially useful. Some students say not useful. In order to understand this fully, the interview data fully, and how they interact with the courses fully, I, we used theory of planned behavior. And in this model, we have three things. They determine the intention of using. These three factors are attitudes, subjective norm, norms, and perceived behavioral control. So attitude means whether they have a positive or negative feeling. What kind of feeling do they have? That is attitude. Subjective norm is basically social pressure, like, OK, basically people decide, make the decision based on social pressure. So that is another thing. Behavioral control, their self-efficacy, their belief, whether they can use the system or not, are they capable, capable or not, that is a perceived behavioral control. And these three things will determine their intention of using anything. And that intention will determine their behavior. So I use this framework to explain this use of the computer coaches. So in terms of attitude, I said, what is their attitude about coach, coaching, and problem solving? And social pressure means what do they feel about the pressure or the motivation from teacher, peer, and classroom? Are, do, what kind of ease do they have with physics and math and computer? So that is also going to determine. Basically, that's what we found from the interview. And based on these three things, yes, these are the factors they will influence students' uses of the computer courses. So based on those factors, whether they like to, whether they like or dislike, that is determined based on these three things. And now that like or dislike, and based on that, they will use the degree and pattern of the uses will be determined by that. So this is computer courses uses extended pattern. Ultimately, these things will determine their learning, their performance. OK, so uh, I mapped that model to explain my our interview data here. So here I am just, uh, I, I don't know if I, we have time to read all those texts, but I would like to summarize what is there. Uh, if you want to read the quotes, that is fine. Uh, but basically, attitude, what do they have what kind of attitude do they have about the coaches? So oh, yes. this is about three minutes, three minutes for presentation. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you. And basically, time expectation. Yes, uh, please feel free to read the text. Uh, I mean, this is just the quote, student quote. But I coded or mapped this way. Time is one thing, attitude, and usefulness, feedback, and learning resource. So basically, green and red means they have positive or novice novice like or the expert like expert means green five means novice what kind of attitude did they have so i mapped that way and likewise there is instructor influence peer influence and classroom environment that also impacted their use so and here are the quotes from his students and here there are no uh, expert or novice thing therefore i just wrote them as a numbers rather than expert like or novice like. Therefore, there are no green or what are the other color? Great. Yeah. Only black in this case. Everything, uh, there is no expert or novice like thing. Likewise, uh, behavioral control, 
prior math knowledge, prior physics knowledge, and comfort of the tool. These are other factors. They impact their uh, intention of use or performance. So basically, uh, yes, I look, looks like I have to a little bit quicker here. So interview analysis shows a relationship between usage pattern with the students' likability of the web-based coaches. Basically, oh, by the way, I must explain this one. Uh, we found three patterns, clicking, reflecting, and optimizing. These are the three ways they used after analyzing videos. So clicking is just clicking without reflecting. Reflecting is a little bit reflecting, but optimizing is the one where they do the problem separately and then use the coaches whenever needed. So there are three types of uses. And we found that clicking was not useful. I mean, they're not so helpful. Um, optimizing was helpful, and therefore they found it useful. And one more result is that, yes, um, the favorable categorical attributes were linked to useful. Whenever students say useful, actually they are connected to the favorable attributes. Uh, sorry that I could not because of the time thing. I have to go real quick, but uh, feel free to ask me later uh, if you have anything. And I have one more uh, data to show and then I'll summarize. Uh, basically, uh, um, yes, optimizers were the most effective users, as you can see from the graph. That's all I have to say. Uh, without more explanation, I would like to summarize my talk. Um, yes, we saw that students can be taught transferable intellectual and practical skills. It is possible. And we can innovate our curriculum or we can innovate our learning tools in order to achieve that goal. That's what we learned. And yes, we also found that interdisciplinary service skills can be taught, but for that we must do interdisciplinary and meaningful um, integration. And since I talked about computer courses, I would like to mention something, summarize something from this. Yes, we found that computer courses, yes, we found them useful because a student can do the problem on their own pace. And using plan, theory of plan behavior, we identify the factors, determinants of the student behavior and user acceptance, acceptance of the coaches. Um, finally, I would like to suggest that um, whenever we are using a technology, we must not, we must help develop their self-efficacy. And we must prepare them in the relevant skills okay. to teach them well so that they can learn and they can transfer well. So that is all. And uh, so here is my email address. And if you have any questions, and if you would like to know more about this, please let me know. Please contact me. Thank you very oh, much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Al. It was outstanding presentation. You did fantastic job. Hopefully, uh, all the audience became very happy to see this new uh, idea in uh, uh, physics teaching or teaching of any subjects. So I can take one or two questions. Audience, if you have any question to Dr. Aryal, please unmute yourself and ask question now. Yeah, so this is Sambu Gimire. I have a question. I, I, I completely agree with uh, Rudra, sir. The talk was fantastic. And um, uh, especially, you know, computer coaching, you know, during this uh, pandemic uh, time uh, is an excellent one. Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, whether this could be applied um, also to high school students, um, you know, because uh, if it is possible, that would be a great uh, help um, for lots of high schools um, in, in areas, right, during this time. Um, and, and the other question is technical. So when you, uh, you know, have students uh, taking uh, these um, uh, questions, like for example, when you're, you know, spending thirty minutes. Uh, so, does the uh, computer optimize um, the level of difficulty uh, depending on the answers that it receives uh, from a student? Uh, because I can imagine that, you know, for example, for um, if so, if a student is not smart enough um, and is still spending like fifteen minutes or something, he or she could be frustrated as well, right? Uh, thank you, Dr. Gamere, uh, for 
the questions. <laughs> uh, so, so first of all, as far as using the tool in high school is concerned, that's an excellent question. Actually, both questions are excellent, and we have been giving thoughts on those. Uh, we can actually uh, change uh, those. We have the uh, framework, software framework, and in that in version two, version one, it is ready to use, so you cannot change. But version two, you can change. You can bypass these steps. Therefore, basically, we can change, use that for, uh, we can make it useful for high school. So where you can make this life easier, maybe easier problems, and then uh, easier steps, maybe they need more scaffolding, therefore you need more steps, easier steps, something like definitely. But those more, that versions uh, that we have created so far, they are meant for algebra-based and calculus-based um, introductory level physics courses. However, we have given some thoughts, and even we had some collaborators from high school. Uh, to consider using that. And uh, the algebra based can be used in high school also. But as far as version two is concerned, once it is fully functional and you can use the platform and that platform you can modify. Uh, and you can, and when you, you modify then students with more capacities, um, we can make them more challenging. And the other thing is to make it uh, challenging enough for more uh, competent students. Uh, there are three paths we provide in version two. One path, if they already know how to do this one, we just give them like just like 30 minutes. They don't take, they don't need 30 minutes. Actually, we, they can bypass the steps and they can finish in 10 minutes. On the other hand, for those students, if they need more help and if they cannot get through in 10 minutes, they must choose another path because they will stop at some point. That means they need more coaching and they must choose the other path. And likewise, we can create three paths for students of three competent levels. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank, you. thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gimene and Dr. Ariel, for uh, both of these are very nice questions. Of course, there might be many, many questions, but Dr. Ariel has uh, written his email on the screen. So please uh, uh, note down that his uh, email, and uh, he, uh, I believe he is always happy to answer your questions. With that, uh, I would like to go to next presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ariel. Now you can thank you. Uh, stop sharing your screen. Uh, Sunita, could you please make a presenter to uh, Dr. Mahindra Thapa? Uh, Sunita, are you there? Okay. Um, so, uh, the next presentation uh, in this series is uh, by Dr. Mahindra Thapa. So, uh, Dr. Mahindra Thapa, are you there? Uh, so, could you please uh, kindly share your screen with us? Uh, yeah, you are... Uh, I believe you are okay. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, yeah, before uh, I, I would like to give a quick information. Right after this session, we have uh, a keynote speaker, Dr. Umeshwar Prasad Joshi from Formilab. So uh, please uh, try to attend that uh, fantastic session. That would be definitely uh, very. Uh, you should not miss that. So uh, Dr. Mahindra Thapa is a physics faculty member at University of California at Chico. Dr. Thapa did his PhD in physics from University of Cincinnati. Today, he is presenting on uh, experiences of promoting equity and diversity in physics teaching and learning. So probably this is completely new for uh, our Nepali school, school in Nepal, uh, but here in the United States, uh, equity and uh, diversity are, uh, are very important topic. So with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Mahindra Thapa. Please share your uh, screen and go ahead, please. Uh, Sunita, uh, can you unmute? Okay, I think, uh, can you unmute uh, the presenter? Uh, how do I do that? Um, Okay, good. Yep, yep. Good to go. So I shared my screen. Did you see, sir? Did you see? We could not see the slide, unfortunately. I could not uh, see. I shared already. So let's see. Uh, yeah. It looks like that you are sharing the screen, but I see something blank, dark. Uh, let's see. So at the yes, bottom sir. there is. There is a third button like uh, share, share your yeah. content. Uh, share, right? Yeah. Share content, right? Yes, that's right. Then start, right? 
I think uh, after share content, then you go to your file and then probably you need to click open or something there. Okay. Uh, uh, so go to the share content and you will see uh, screen one and uh, click the screen one there. Screen. Um, I, see, I see the share content. Yeah. Uh, please and click the share. Just to wait. Share. Yeah, and then there will be share content screen, mm -hmm. and then you will open your PowerPoint so, there. Okay, I'll start share, right? Yep, share content. It's share content. Yeah, and then now, do you see your do you see do you see your computer screen, your own computer screen? So click the file open. Uh, it, uh, share file. Yeah, good. Now, uh, yeah, so, yeah, it says, uh, no, no, it uh, it showed your video actually, the full screen. Uh, um, just okay, one. Uh, uh, so, after share content, there should be the share screen. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, I think, uh, Mahendra, sir, mm -hmm. you should open your file uh, yeah, somewhere file. Desktop, and then share your screen. Uh, then... uh, yeah, I saw the share, the share content, oh, is, is share content? Now, okay. stop saying it's a I almost went to it was showing before. It was showing before. Yeah, I think uh, the you have chosen uh, just a single screen uh, screen share mode. That's why. So if you do all tab, I think uh, it should reappear again. All tab. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because uh, he's sharing two shot of screen. It seems like that. Okay. Let's see. Okay. The, it's a restore. Does it work? Mm -hmm. I with you, sir. Mm -hmm. See, sir, I think uh, you have multiple files. You have a file work on the screen. I just share the screen. Does it work? Yes, yes, yes. 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 I stop sharing, then I start from the file. It's okay. Uh, I got this. I'll open the file. Oh, computer. Yeah, I forget to echo that. Uh, now? Trying to come now. Um, hmm. That's okay. I'm, oh yes, yes, it works now. Yes, sir, it is fine now. So, okay, yeah. thank you, <laughs> thank so, you very much. So, we got uh, PowerPoint mode, PowerPoint slide, mode, display, or no? I think that's good. Like, okay, please go ahead. Okay, so I'll just do that this way. Otherwise, it will. Okay, again. sure. So, okay, thank you, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for the help and and the other sir and Vijay sir, everyone. So, my topic is like the, this is the promotion of equity and diversity in physics teaching and learning. So I would say that because I just sharing my idea about the community college, because I had some uh, small, I teach around one year, have some experience of community teaching. There are a lot of research going on in equity and diversity in the college level, university level. 
but this is different. This is for the community college level. So I would say that this is my personal view. It will not represent any institutions. And this is still in the research phase. So I would say that this is not a still research. So because of time constraint, I will try to uh, accommodate as far as possible. So you know that in community college, it's also called junior college or two-year college. So they basically run short-term courses. Basically, say, for example, the radiology technician, cosmetology, barber training, harp fighter. Beside that, they are also running the program is up to associate bachelor level. So to get the uh, complete bachelor or it's called undergrad degree, they have to go to the college or it's called university more two years then they get the degree otherwise it also remains as a associate bachelor degree and it is completely a smaller size i believe that uh, maximum is 40 or 50 minimum starts with almost eight and it is completely cheaper because all the money comes from the from the county state and the job is also called it's called the what is called government job kind of thing and I just want to uh, go through some cons uh, key facts about community college of California. So we see that nearly 53% are female by gender and by ethnicity, nearly 44% is Hispanic. So these are the key things that force us to con consider equity issues. And many students, after completing two years at community college, they either go to University of California system or California State University system. And so, but mostly are going for the small short term course and prepare for the career or they go to the certificate course, associate degree or could transfer to the other colleges. So we have diverse students, so we should know what kind of students we are teaching. So uh, in uh, community college, students are quite different than the, uh, than the major university level student. For example, I saw in some of my classes, some of the, like uh, the army, retired army, at the age of 35, joined the community college to get some extra degree. So for example, they get some, uh, some kind of, this kind of technician work. So there's a lot of age variations, and you see that nearly 59% of students are part-time. A lot of part-time are there. And a lot of students are first-generation college students. And there's also students from the high school. They are from 11th grade, 12th grade. They are taking the courses from the college in addition to their high school courses. And majority of students are economically disadvantaged and the disabled minority. So diversity means we don't consider the diversity means only the gender. It could be the race, it could be the sexual orientation, it could be the ability, it could be the ethnicity. So we have to consider all those factors when we are teaching at the community college. So I would say that diversity uh, plays an important role. So there's a lot of things going on, these things. So if we want to change, if we want to grow, if we want to innovate, that we have must have to promote uh, this diversity. So diversity creates people to in a hard work thing. So, so diversity is important in that sense. So diversity, after that, this is the term equity, equity and equality are not the same thing. So just this for a picture, I can say that equality means say we have in class three group of students. So some group of students who are managed always can do their work. There, there is, so we don't need extra support for those students. Some students still we need a small support, but we don't need much support to help. But if we don't help those group of students, they will not succeed our course. So, so equality means if we give the same support system, this means this is not the way we will teach in the community college. So to make the equity so that all will succeed, we have to help uh, some group of students who need more support so that all can see, all can succeed in the course. 
So in this game, if we give the same support system, it means equality will not work. To have equality, we need different kinds of support systems. So this is the equity. So equity is the big issue these days. So this is the very uh, big issue these days. So we can find tons of materials in the web. So you can see a lot of things. So um, in community college, we are, considering, we are considering these kind of things. So now uh, to promote, promote the equity and diversity, college is also doing itself a lot of work. Now I'm, I'm thinking, I'm presenting what is our role to promote the equity in, in the diversity, especially in our physics class. So, okay, what happened again? Okay. Okay, thank you. So uh, it's happened. <laughs> so in community college in California, sorry again, please. In California, to promote the equity and the uh, uh, in the diversity, they use this approach, the guided pathway approach. So this guided pathway approach takes a student to the success level. So it has four pillars. That is the clarity of the path, enter in the path, stay on the path, and ensure ensure to the learning in the path. These are the four pillars that in the California, California community college system use to make the uh, to make equity and uh, diversity uh, flourish in the classroom. So first we go to the what is clarify the path. So the college, the, the counselor do a lot of work to say which path is good for the student, but in instructor level. So for example, in my physics class, like uh, the people who are taking computer science engineering course and who are taking the electrical engineering they are not taking the same sequence of course say for example 4a 4b 4c so better to we have to tell them that which sequence is good for this particular major group so this will clear that they know what course they, what course they have to take otherwise they, they miss some course then this this uh, this, this takes uh, uh, again they are taking this course in somewhere else this sequence will not be filtered there second is enter the path once a student comes in the path our goal is to make they stay in the class they will not leave our class so they will be successful in the class so as an instructor um, i would try to make my website it's easy to navigate they explain i could explain the courses Sometimes I need to increase the section cap and I have to reduce the studio type trait and provide safe learning environment. And, you know, this is the ultimate goal if we have to promote the collaborations. So, for example, this is just my example. It could be different. That is from instructor to instructor. In my course, they know what they have to do before starting the course, what they are doing in the each group. They know in the syllabus, what syllabus they have and i also these are the important aspect for instructor i will talk briefly so this screen and each point it will take a student to that particular point so for example before starting the quiz they have to read the syllabus and take the syllabus quiz but they must have to get 100 percent to go forward in my course if they don't get 100 percent in syllabus quiz and if they don't do pre-course assignment they are not getting any grades it does not matter what homework, what assignment they do. The reason is that I remember my time when I did, I, I was in ISC, I don't know slavers till I passed three months. Later, I know that, oh, these slavers existed. So I don't want to put my student in the same situation. They must know what my slavers is. And this pre-course, uh, this uh, assignment will basically tell what a student already know. This is the great things. If they know already thing, uh, uh, it's not a good idea to repeat, repeat the same thing again. So I have made, it depends on the instructor, I make like 40 to 60 questions uh, almost so they can, and this, is, this is on kind of what it's called multiple choice questions they can give, but they are not getting, getting punished for doing wrong. So I do this thing, so this will basically help the instructor to go forward. Uh, and. 
Uh, so for example, this is just the mode, they can go to the slavers each point, and this is the, they do the slavers quiz. This is the great point to know your students. So for, for example, introduce yourself. So I put my introductions, what I'm teaching, what I do from where, from where I belong. So they will put their story. Once we know their story, which background from they came from, whether uh, what they are doing, what's their major, it's very easy to teach accordingly. We can put the similar kind of examples in the classroom. So in the first week, they know what they have to do. Uh, so in this tab, they will know like uh, what they will do in the first week, what the learning objective, uh, what materials they have to read, what video they, they need to watch, what they have to discuss, what's the homework, what's the quiz. Then I put everything in one place so that they know what exactly they are doing in the first week. So again, if they go to this first week tab, they know that what they are doing in the first week. So there's a list of things they know they are exactly doing that thing so that they will not miss uh, any kind of assignment and any kind of reading things. Important part is the rubric. If I take the point, in any homework, any assignment, anything, I must have to say why I take your point, why I'm taking this point. So rubric will help a lot to explain, hey, this is the reason you, you did not explain that particular point. That's why you get the, this your point is off by that thing. So if rubric will help to us to save in in um, very, a lot of situations. So, and Sometimes we have to increase the cap. So for example, if my section has only 40 cap, and sometimes there is some student, they must have to take that course. Otherwise they have to wait the next six months to take that course. So we are considering that situations, we have to increase the cap. And important part is these days, textbook are very costly. That's the reason better to try to use open textbook. There are tons of open textbook, they're very nice we can use these things so that they, uh, that they will not expend money on the textbook which are very costly these days. Important part is the stereotype threat. They, for example, stereotype by like, Asians are good at math. This is my, yeah. So this hurts this kind of thing. If there are some Asians are there, they think that they are good at math, it may not be true. But this kind of stereotype threat, we have to remove from our classroom. So I'm trying to remove those kind of things in the our classroom. Other thing is the safe, safe, uh, safe learning environment. So safe learning environment means that if they ask any kind of questions to the students, they will not think that because of that questions, their grade is going down or a student is going to laugh at, at him. So and we are saying that no questions are very good, no questions are very bad. So I generally say in the classroom, be supportive of each other, criticize idea, but not the people. Report bad behavior. You must have to report bad behavior. Don't use profanity, follow the rules. So these are things to make the class equitable. We are trying to do these things. And other things that we have to encourage self-motivated students. Uh, about five minutes, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank okay, you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and in the, in the path, in the same thing, in the, it is the inclusive teaching. So we have done uh, seen a lot of things that inclusive teaching is important in the sense that all should participate. They feel free, uh, uh, free to ask the questions. So in, including teaching is the important part. And other is the growth mindset. So for example, uh, just example, if you want to travel from one place to another place, it does not matter. We are taking cheap car or the expensive car. But the key thing that we have to reach at that goal. So they have to work hard so that they can so that they can reach that. So there's a goal oriented that this is the growth mindset is the key important part. And uh, the creativity, we want to create creativity in our classroom. So that in my perspective, I try to use the open ended questions. This is my experience and uh, I have collected some kind of result data will present sometimes in future. And our lab report should be similar to scientific presentation so that they know what kind of scientific presentation looks like. And key thing is the accessibility. In our classroom, there are some students who cannot see. In our classroom, there are people who cannot hear. So our all course materials should be designed according to them. So 
And there are a lot of things in the web page. It's called Universal Design of Learning. They tell you how to help those kind of students. So just for example, in PDF file, in our courses, we upload a lot of PDF files. So this PDF file should be accessible to those students who cannot hear, who, who are basically in raw form, we can say blind. So just I give the example that uh, in our uh, Acrobat Pro, you can use uh, this software and you can check the accessibility. If you check the accessibility, click, you are, yeah, this is just my, for example, you have to click the full check, that gives you uh, that what is good, what is bad. If those things are not clear, means the people who have difficulty in hearing, those people who have difficulty in seeing uh, the things, they cannot read your video. So you have to load the upload the things so that they can be accessible to everyone. And Ramesh already presented about the lab, but in my case, I use the investigative science learning environment that talks about what kind of lab we are doing. We are not giving everything, they're just filling up and submitted that. So investigative science learning environment lab, they have a lot of tools that are going to help how to, they are working in a group, uh, how the open-ended questions are there, how is um, we, uh, this kind of activities, active learning activities and diversity of teaching methodology are included in this lab also. So this is just example. And fourth is that we want to put our student in the path. So we already talked about these things. Uh, I will explore these things. So we are using technology to boost equity and diversity. Because you know that all student is shy, some student are shy in talking in front of class or in front of instructor. So I use generally in the Zoom, I use chat session so they can type their questions if they don't want to talk in the mass. So there is a tool so called Clicker and the Flipgrid. They can use, these are the great tools so that we can see what they want, uh, what is their focus. Some instructor also use Facebook page, but I don't use that. So. We have to use it in community college setting, we have to use as an informal advisor. Informal means we don't say do this, but we expect that if you do this thing, you can ask your um, mentor, they will advise you, but this is my suggestions, we can say like this. So this is a small set uh, research I have done a lot ago that if this is the simple questions we give, time say is two period, two seconds, we just find the length of the pendulum. I find that 17 different kind of 17 different kind of answers student gives. I just put it four, but they give 17 different kind of answers. But if, if you give the any kind of device computer, they give the exact answer. So this means they are very hard to in the paper. So uh, another thing in the course, we have to incorporate the topics which could help them to get the jobs. So computational skill and the skills what the employer wants, we have to include those parts in any format in our course. So this is my conclusion that uh, diversity and uh, equity and diversity should be promoted depending on uh, at our college level, at, at our instructor level. These are the things I generally do, but I have some result of this data, but I still I have to do some more work. Thank you very much. These are the resources you can use. Any question? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for very nice talk, Dr. Tapa. It is outstanding. So because of the time constraint, uh, I would like to stop the session now. Uh, sorry for the uh, not getting the questions. Uh, I would like to sincerely request all of you audience. So uh, uh, there is another link which I have posted in the uh, in the chat box, or probably you might have gotten that in the PDF document that Enpa sent to you. So uh, with that, I would like to sincerely thank from the bottom of my heart to all the speaker in this session. Thank you so much. And I would like to invite you to join the keynote speaking thank session. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Thank you. So uh, we can, we can uh, join directly now, yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, but there is a different, uh, uh, not in this uh, link. There is a different link. Uh, uh, Madam Sir. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. I'm just uh, going. Uh, so, Sunita, uh, are you are you ending this session? Sunita, are you there?
Uh, yes, I'll end the session in a while. I will let them check the chat box for some time. Oh, okay. So you'll be ending the session, then we'll join another link, right? Okay. Okay. Thank yes, you very yes. much. Okay. So.